host David, KK6M for the Papa System monthly Zoom session. We did we did miss one month, and that was uh, last month, partly because we had uh, we started up our our uh, monthly meetings in person, and then we had and we had a uh, picnic, so it was very very hectic, and uh, I think it was almost too busy to have a, a Zoom session, so. We skipped last month, and now we'll, we'll get back to a regular schedule. So if anyone has uh, uh, speaker ideas or people that, that are experts in their field that uh, you have access to, please forward that information to me because I'm always looking for, for speakers. It's not the easiest thing in the world to, to do, um, to find people like Bob, AK6R, that will you know, have, have, have the expertise and the willingness and time to come and present to us is not always the easiest thing to do. So um, I'm very grateful to Bob for, uh, for coming. Cecil, do you have any, any uh, uh, system announcements or anything you want to say before we ramble on here a little bit? Absolutely. I'd like to thank Bob, first of all, uh, for joining us and, and bringing his expertise to the PAPA system. Much appreciated. I know how valuable time is when you get as young as us. So, hang on a second. Let me uh, turn the radios off in the background. Sorry about that. Yeah, I got a lot, a lot to say actually, but I'll keep it really short. We, uh, I just want to thank all the people behind the scene that never seem to get thanked. Uh, you know, we get the complaints that something isn't working, but you know, we got fifty-eight repeaters online. Uh, 29 hilltops and uh, I'm just going to point out what happened this morning. Uh, Chris drove up to, uh, to San Inez with uh, Mike and they had an issue with the internet. Uh, the power went off and then the hill went down again. And so this morning Ira got up probably at around four o'clock and headed up to San Inez and, and brought the system back up. That's what this what makes our system so unique is the volunteers that dedicate literally thousands of hours to keep the system running. His round trip, he lives in Ventura, but even though he's still going to give up four or five hours of his life to get up there to get the D-Star DMR and the analog repeater back online. The power went off. We have an HTML strip, but probably when the voltage came up, or the generators came up, it knocked the system off and he had to go do it physical uh, to get, you know, to unplug everything and get it working again. Or I'm not sure, I didn't get a report back, but nevertheless, he might not be listening, but I'd like the members to know that the system stays up and running uh, because of all of the volunteers behind the scenes. Uh, We've got the uh, DMR dilemma that we had with Vimaster. We got all except two back on, and uh, we're going to get Sunset back on, and then we'll have uh, the majority of the, uh, by next Sunday, we'll have Lucan's and Sunset back on the DMR. And uh, with Rex uh, listening, uh, we are going to be doing uh, door prizes for the big events, Rex and uh, probably door prizes at the, uh, at the uh, Papa breakfasts and lunches uh, to help us uh, continue the expansion of updating the D-Star and DMR. The long-term plan, guys, is that we're gonna replace all of the D-Star repeaters, which uh, we've replaced three with new SLR 5700 uh, uh, Motorola. They come with a five-year warranty. We've got better than a seven dB gain on the uh, on the transmit and a two and a half on receive because they're designed for a commercial environment. So they're proven to be really working out well. We did uh, Santiago, Edom Hill, and San Inez. Uh, the rest, as the D Star fails, the repeater fails. We We've got it in, we will have an inventory to replace the D Star and the 8400 Motorola's that are now about seven to eight years old with uh, SLR 5700. 
And we have, last but not least, Keith uh, uh, AB6IX has uh, uh, added uh, a needles repeater to give us coverage uh, uh, in uh, the Colorado River, uh, Parker Dam, uh, Bullhead City, and uh, Laughlin. So we're we're still growing, <laughs> thanks to the membership and the support of the membership. That's it. Thanks for the time, David. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Cecil, for working so hard uh, to keep this system running. Uh, we are we are a big system, and it does take a lot of volunteers. And so we're always looking for for help. Uh, I, I take care of some of the things, but I'm, I'm, I'm always needing people to help me. So if anyone wants to donate a little bit of time uh, to help the POP system out, certainly you can contact me and I'll, I'll direct you into place where it probably would do the most good. Um, is there anyone, uh, Ed, do you have anything uh, that you want to add before we introduce um, Bob? No, other than, uh, you know, there's a couple questions in chat about um, door prize and such. Uh, we'll definitely have that at the Fiesta. So um, looking forward to that at the end of the year. Uh, other than that, um, I'm ready to learn about um, RFI. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, the in-person in uh, VE testing will, uh, will eventually start again in Orange County and in other spots. Uh, in the meantime, I would recommend that you contact Norm K6YXH and arrange for a in-person, or excuse me, Zoom session uh, testing. Um, Bob, who's uh, kindly agreed to join us today, is a chief engineer at, at uh, Palomar Engineering in San Diego. I think it's out of San Marcos, as a matter of fact. Its call sign is AK6R, and he's been chief engineer there for quite a while. Uh, Palomar Engineering is, is a, a fantastic uh, company. It produces uh, products for the International Space Station, military, commercial, uh, amateur radio use, uh, dealing with all kinds of issues with uh, RFI and, and other radio-related uh, difficulties. I've known uh, Bob to help me when I wanted to replace my ballon that, that burned up because I was giving it a little bit too much juice on a frequency that wasn't exactly resonant. And so I learned a couple things about balance from, from Bob. And uh, I, I really, really appreciate that because, you know, a lot of these balance are rated at a certain, a certain uh, power level, but that's only at absolute resonance. Once you go off resonance, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the current goes up. In, in the balance and they're not necessarily going to be rated for the same power level. So, you know, you put a thousand watts into something that's not absolutely resonant and, and you have a tendency to, to heat it up a little bit. Anyway, I burned two of them up, which were not Palomars. So then I got one of the Palomar engineering uh, balance uh, plus a choke balance on my uh, 80 meter loop. And that thing's been singing like, like a jaybird. It's just been absolutely playing really, really well. And so I wanted to thank Bob personally for the advice I got and for okay. the products that I received from Palomar. And uh, they, they just work superbly well. So with that, uh, Bob, you can, uh, you can uh, take it away and let's see if we can go to speaker view. There we go. All right, thank you, Bob, and I'll mute and then you can uh, take it away. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? I hope so, good, all right. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for the generous introduction, and uh, you're to be congratulated as a group. I really haven't done too much with Papa, but uh, after looking at your website and all your connections and stuff, congratulations on having just a wonderfully unique system, which is uh, a backup for all of us in these uh, trying times. That's for darn sure. And I'm glad you got the got look at glad you got the volunteers. I do see a few familiar faces on the screen, so some of you may have heard this before in another club or something. I I, I do quite a few of these across the nation, and I've done a lot of them for the AWRL and those types of things. So if you've heard it before, there's always a there's always a few new things in here, and we try and uh, uh, give the talks. Um, 
that are related to uh, uh, not only uh, your VHF, UHF, but uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about RFI too. So I'm going to share a screen here and let me go down and uh, get, uh, get my screen set up for you guys. There we go. All right, so you should be seeing a a PowerPoint screen on there now. It's the ABCs of RFI for hams. And it uh, uh, takes about uh, 45 minutes to an hour to go through this, depending upon number of questions and things like that. But uh, hopefully what you'll do is you'll learn a little bit about RFI as it applies to all different frequency ranges. But more importantly, you'll, you'll learn a little bit about how to use uh, ferrites, which are wonderful RFI suppressors. I know uh, our own repeater system, the Palomar Amateur Radio Club, has got about 50 pounds of ferrites up there, all in strategic spots in order to solve unique problems with, uh, I think they have about seven repeaters up there on the top of the hill, but they uh, co-share it with a lot of commercial repeaters and things too, which cause interference to ours and vice versa. And so there's always ways to get rid of some of the RFI issues, uh, uh, not only in the RF lines, but also in the audio lines and the internet connections and those types of things. So a lot of this stuff is applicable to uh, uh, many types of uh, things. Well, anyway, let's get started here. Um, we're going to go down, uh, do, do a little bit about the Palomar history, if, uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Palomar was founded uh, in 1965 by Jack Althaus. Uh, K6NY. He passed away in 2013, and my wife and I uh, uh, took over the business and uh, bought it. And uh, at that point in time, it was a 10 foot by 10 foot storage area. And the kids had inherited it when the father died and uh, didn't know what to do with it. But uh, I knew it had been advertising in QST magazine for over 40 years and it had a good name. So uh, we took that company and uh, turned it into an RFI solutions company. Uh, for those of you who may remember, uh, it was uh, the predecessor to MFJ when Martin Ju uh, saw all the different products that Palomar had. He copied many of those, took those to China and made them cheaper and got us out of the business essentially. But quite a few of the products, the antenna tuners and the noise bridges and all those types of things, still useful. And I've got a whole uh, uh, museum of those uh, parts. In fact, um, on our website, I also have all the manuals for all the old Palomar products too, in case you're in case you come by one that um, uh, that you uh, don't have, have information on, or if you have one you want to donate to the museum, I'd be glad to put that in there too and give you some credit for it. Uh, our product line now consists of ferrite core products, all different types of ferrites, and we're going to describe what those are, what they actually do, and how you use them. But we also, as uh, David said, uh, have lots of balance, onions, and uh, feed line chokes. And uh, they're very, very useful, as we'll see in, uh, in some of the slides to follow. We do a lot of antenna systems, too. In fact, it's one of our top sellers. We do off-center feds, uh, end feds, uh, loops, and terminated uh, 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 dipoles and things like that for the military. And uh, in fact, I have uh, a PowerPoint talks on every one of those things. So. Um, I'm, I can always come back and talk about uh, uh, the secrets of NFED antennas, for example, is one of the ones we have. And by the way, all these presentations, including today's presentation, is on our website under technical support. You can uh, see uh, the ones we've done in the past. We, uh, <clears throat> uh, Jack Althaus, is, uh, his uh, pen name was Kurt Sturba, by the way, and uh, uh, all those uh, books and downloads are on our website for free. You can download them and uh, and read them, and they're they're quite hilarious. He wrote for uh, a CQ magazine under the Kurt Sturba name for many many years, a couple decades, I think. And I have uh, all those. Uh, most of those are online and they're free. Uh, we distribute all our products through Ham Radio Outlet Direct, and we also sell on eBay. And we have dealers in uh, Switzerland and South America, and uh, and always looking for for more folks to uh, to work at our look at our products. We, we uh, also market to the consumer, commercial, and also the military mar uh, uh, markets. Most of the uh, uh, military uh, 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 communication bands across the United States, there's 487 of them that I know about, all have our ferrites in them. <laughs> and there's probably 20 or 30 pounds in each one. So they're, they're very well, uh, very well uh, equipped. All right, so let's go talk a little bit about RFI. 
And uh, this is a picture of my wife on a good day, my ex-wife on a good day, many, many years ago. And are you the source of RFI? And uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, yeah, we're going to be, she, that's in one of her good days, yeah. Are you the source of RFI? And, and, and uh, it's all your fault because of that big antenna. And a lot of people, uh, that's, that's the problem. Uh, in, in one case, uh, I had an antenna up without a feed line on it. And everybody, my, all my neighbors would come by and say, hey, you're causing me interference. And I say, it's not even hooked up. And so it's a, it's a problem. But uh, uh, <clears throat> a lot of times you're the source of RFI because either you have a big antenna or or uh, uh, you actually are the source of RFI and you're creating interference to uh, touch lamps or, or, uh, or electronics in your own house. And uh, on the other hand, you also may be uh, so fortunate that you've done a lot of that and you get a Worked All Neighbors Award. In fact, that's a free download uh, certificate that you can get. And uh, I've had over 10,000 of those downloaded. So there must be a problem out there from, from everybody. But uh, Worked All Neighbors and uh, put your radio station name in there. We'll sign it and uh, send it out to you. Or, or you can just download it and, and uh, fill it out yourself. But it's kind of a spoof uh, uh, certificate that uh, I've been quite surprised the number of the downloads on that one. And it's, uh, it's free on the website too, by the way. So do people actually believe that it's not hooked up when you say that? Or do they just like, you know, they just don't get it. It's like, no, some, it's not working, but. No, sometimes I actually take them out there and see there's there's no transmission line. There's no way that it's even hooked up. So yeah. uh, generally I can get away with it, but uh, uh, I've been here long enough and, and we've got enough antennas up. If you turn the corner and you look at my site, I've got three acres here and a lot of log periodics and everything else. Pretty much everybody knows that if there's a problem in the neighborhood. Uh, they either they're going to come to me, or if all the power goes out, I'm the only guy that's got uh, power and can communicate. So, on the other hand, uh, if you're not the source of, you may be the victim of local RFI, and more, and and these days that's more of a problem uh, for most of us because we have high noise levels, uh, we have interference between different devices. Uh, there's effectively no uh, uh, RFI. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, enforcement below 30 megahertz for sure. And so a lot of these devices uh, uh, interfere with HF radios, but also uh, uh, each other. And uh, a lot of your computers will slow down uh, only because you're transmitting and they're error correcting and those types of things. But uh, uh, it's a real problem. And uh, we have um, we have some solutions for that to get rid of some of that, some of those types of noises, which we'll, we'll show you in a couple of minutes here. Today we're going to go over uh, basically uh, five different things. One is uh, just learning the fundamentals of RFI. How do you identify it? Uh, what are the symptoms? Uh, how do you uh, uh, pinpoint some of the causes? And then and what are some simple cures that you can do in, uh, quickly? We'll talk about ferrite filters, how to choose and buy the right one for your issue, and how to use how to use ferrites to solve the number one problem shared by all hams using coax fed antennas. Uh, it's a big problem. It's easy to fix, and you just got to know what to do and how to use ferrites to solve um, transmitter RFI problems, reduce your noise floor, and keep your neighbors and spouse happy. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. You can have one little piece of, of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, a metal to do all that. And understanding the concepts, and we're not going to use any math today other than a few formulas to take a look at. So no calculations, but we got to put our thinking caps on to, uh, uh, to go through it. So let's define what is RFI. Basically, it's a radio frequency, and the radio frequency in my terms is anything above about 100 kilohertz. That includes switching power supplies all the way up to uh, uh, two to four gigahertz, which is about the max that we go up to. Uh, radio frequency disturbance that causes an electrical circuit to function improperly. That's pretty general. Uh, some of the common sources uh, that can cause that are things that we can't fix, uh, sunspots, cosmic noise, lightning, atmospheric, AC power lines. Generally, there's no ferrite fix for that other than calling the power company for the power line issues. Uh, but uh, uh, those, uh, those take a long time to fix. Uh, there are lots of, of what we call transmitters, and transmitters are in the classic, you know, the ham radio, CB, AM, FM, electronic devices, but also anything that acts as a transmitter. Uh, speed controllers, 
you know, every every motor in California now has to be a pulse width modulated, basically variable speed motor. That's air conditionings, uh, washer dryers, you name it. And I tell you, they're just noisier than heck. If you ever buy a device or a washer dryer by LG, or you buy a refrigerator, uh, an Ethernet refrigerator by LG, you'll be you'll be tracking down uh, noise problems forever. Uh, switching power supplies, computer electronics. Uh, uh, Roku systems are notoriously noisy, for example. Uh, cable DSL uh, routers also uh, can, can be pretty noisy. Uh, common victims are any electronic device that malfunctions because of interference. And uh, there's new ones popping up every day, but um, uh, they're relatively easy to, um, to identify and fix. So let's, um, let's, let's go over to the next slide and how do you actually get RFI? All right, now, in order to have RFI, you have to have what we call the EMI triangle. There's gotta be a source, there's gotta be a victim, and there's gotta be a way between the victim and the source. And that's, all, that's usually the hardest part to determine is what is that coupling path? And the coupling path can be either through the air, all right, for example, a, a, an LED light in your garage may be emitting a, a, a transmission of RFI or radio frequency interference through the air. You may be doing it when you transmit on your uh, your handy talkie or your transmit on your tra uh, your radio. Uh, your uh, the signal goes into the antenna. The antenna gets into the AC power lines of uh, either your house or the house next door, and then it causes a, a device to uh, malfunction because it doesn't know what to do with that frequency. Uh, it may also be just inductive. You 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 may have a coaxial cable that's next to a AC power line in your attic. If you have a if you're live in a homeowners association, for example, and you can't have antennas, and you put them close to um, uh, close to other wires in your house, they pick up the uh, the energy, create a current, and cause interference. <clears throat> Capacitive coupling is also another way. Uh, generally, uh, um, RFI from a practical standpoint, from a ham radio standpoint, is usually um, uh, coming in through a wire and getting to that wire and identifying the source of it is, is usually the, uh, the challenge. So it's how to find the source and the path. And once you know that, then you can identify how to stop, put a stop sign on the path so that it doesn't get to the, uh, uh, to the uh, victim. So a couple of uh, <clears throat> typical RFI issues in your shack transmit uh, wise would be, and these are caused by your transmitter or your antenna. Uh, you get a hot microphone, okay? Uh, you're, you get RF lip burns. If you have one of the old D104 mics or a metal mic or something like that, you get too close to it and you have a lot of RFI, you'll get a real nice kiss. <laughs> in fact, I always tell people that was my first kiss I got when I was 12 years old and I became a ham radio operator. It was from a D104 mic and RFI on an 813 linear amplifier. I know, I remember the date exactly. Uh, but also you'll, you'll have distorted audio. Um, antennas that don't tune correctly, they have high SWR or your coax is radiating. That's another uh, uh, transmit symptom. Uh, your voice or your transmission causes interference with consumer electronic devices acting as ham radio receivers. Okay, this, this, is, this one's pretty, um, pretty common, particularly on HF. Um, uh, you may be talking on your uh, your uh, radio and you're coming across your home theater system or your subwoofer or your uh, 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 your audio system on a uh, that's that's attached to uh, long long wires or long speaker wires. Uh, garage door openers may open uh, open up and close as you transmit. I had a colonel call me from uh, Oklahoma and he said, "Son, I got a problem here. I put some new radios in uh, my uh, aircraft, and every time they go over this particular homeowners association, all 100 garage doors open up simultaneously." And uh, so he ordered a whole bunch of our garage door opener RFI kits and installed them and the problem went away. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing some of the things that uh, get affected. Uh, when I moved into this new property, um, I do a lot of CW at high power and all my sprinkler lights, sprinkler systems would go on and off to the dits and the dahs. And my neighbors would come over and say, how come your sprinklers are acting up? And I say, well, that's just the way I water. And they, they bought that for about the first week. But after that, I, uh, I fixed the problem and it didn't do it anymore. But quite often you have blinking lights and things like that. 
and and or the last thing is your spouse alarm goes off and said honey i can't watch dancing with the stars when you're on the radio you're going to have to get off those types of things all right uh, received symptoms are caused by sources usually outside your radio and these are high noise levels all right it's a pain it's a pain to try and listen to a a person uh, talking when you have a high noise level behind them or you have a lot of static uh, birds uh, birdies chirps buzzes clicks broadband noise across the entire uh, uh, spectrum if you're on um, uh, 40 meters on 7198 you're going to hear every one of the um, uh, <clears throat> solar systems in your neighborhood because they come across that frequency and also 14.198 um, they're very, uh, very popular on those two frequencies. Uh, distorted uh, radio, uh, receiver audio is another characteristic that, um, that you'll hear. So there are, um, there are lots of things out there that can cause interference. And there are lots of things that um, you, you may be causing interference to, uh, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, some of the antennas, so to speak, in the paths uh, can be identified by the, the frequency that you're uh, hearing the interference on. For example, uh, if you're getting interference on AM broadcast or anything between about the 160 and the 30 meter bands, you have to look for long antennas because normally you have long antennas for those, uh, those frequencies. And so what are long antennas? Well, AC power lines in your house, uh, telephone DSL lines, think about it. You probably got a thousand feet of those in your house. Uh, satellite cable uh, coaxes uh, from your satellite dishes, typically 50 to 100 feet long. Uh, these days, uh, there's houses with uh, complete ethernet cables in all the walls. Uh, even so, you probably have 20 or 30 feet of those, which make very nice resonant antennas on, on 20 meters. Antenna feed line, coax shields, uh, we'll be talking about that in a second. Uh, antenna control rotor cables, aren't right? rotor cables, control cables, they act as receivings. And really, you need a rotor, you, each one of your rotors really needs an RFI kit on, on both ends in order to, pre to prevent uh, interference to the rotor and also to uh, uh, prevent uh, feeding back into your shack. Uh, second story, ground wires, avoid quarter wavelength, 5th, 16 feet. I've had so many people call me and say, I'm on the second floor and I got RFI in 20 meters. How do I solve it? And generally what happens is, is they have about a 16 foot uh, uh, ground cable going outside to a stake in the ground. And that's a, that's a quarter wavelength. And if you're a quarter wavelength at zero ohms on one end, you're gonna be a quarter wavelength. On the other end, you're gonna have a high impedance. That high impedance means you're really not at ground and you're floating and uh, you're going to have RFI all over the place. So I just told them you don't need any ferrites or anything. You just change your feed line length to 20 feet uh, or your, your ground length and the problem went away. So just be aware of using resonant quarter wave uh, uh, lines on anything uh, that you're not supposed to. Now, on the other hand, on, on FM broadcast, 20 meters up to about 500 megahertz, a look for short antennas, and a short antenna can be a speaker wire, it can be a mic cable, uh, it can be a device interconnect cable between your computer and your radio, for example. These are short cables, and typically they act as antennas uh, for high frequency uh, RFI. And um, so if you're experiencing it on those frequencies, look for short antennas. And what we like to do is put a stop sign on those little short wires and uh, it'll stop the uh, RFI from coming in, yet provide a path for the regular signals. These antennas, so to speak, pick up radiated or conducted RFI, which induces a current uh, on all the unshielded antenna conductors from an RFI source. All right, so the question is, is how do we reduce that current? That's really the problem. So let's go to a couple of ways. Here's two, uh, two quick examples. Uh, one on the right side is, uh, is the source, uh, the, the red one is a source transmitter and it's got an antenna and it radiates and that radiation uh, causes interference to a victim receiver. On the other hand, you may have uh, on the left-hand side, you have a victim receiver, which could be a home theater system, could be an audio system, could be uh, uh, all different types of electronic devices. And there's some radiation out there somewheres 
and there's an antenna and that antenna again could be the AC power lines, could be a mic cable, could be a computer USB cable uh, going into a computer, for example. Um, and it uh, has a, um, it picks up that signal, converts it to a, to a, a current, that current goes into the receiver and causes interference. And there's a simple way to stop that is we put what they call a choke in there. You can see those two little black dots on the vertical lines. Those are chokes. And what they do is they reduce the interfering signal. And we'll see how that works in a minute. But uh, the principle is, is it works on both source transmitters and receivers uh, to stop those, um, those interfering signals. The typical solutions, not only are ferrites, but you can use resonant traps uh, filters with high choking impedance and those types of things. In the old days, we used to use low pass filters on our uh, on our uh, vacuum tube uh, uh, equipment, our transmitters, uh, to to make sure that we did we weren't transmitting above 30 megahertz, for example, with the harmonics. Uh, but today, that's uh, we do it a little bit differently. So we have to go to Ohm's law to kind of figure out uh, some of the principles behind how why. Uh, uh, why and how we can uh, reduce this current. If you remember Ohm's law, you see it on the right hand side there, it's E on the top, which is uh, voltage, and then there's I is current and R is resistance. And so in order to reduce the uh, uh, current, uh, which is uh, the voltage divided by the resistance, we have a couple of choices. One is we can shut down the source. We can turn off the transmitter, set E to zero. And therefore, I becomes zero. Uh, we, there's a couple other ways to do it. One is to uh, choke the path uh, between the uh, the transmitter and the receiver, and uh, that means making R uh, bigger. All right, and R be, making R bigger. R has to be about a thousand ohms in order to have any measurable difference. All right. If we want to protect the victim, we can make R really big, or five times, or ten times bigger. In this case. Uh, protecting the victim, and that'll make R go very, very low. I mean, I go very, very low, and therefore you don't have much interference and you won't hear it. So here's a trivia question for those uh, who want to think about it. If E is electromotive force and R is resistance, how come uh, current is not abbreviated by C, but they use the letter I? So what does I stand for is the question. And think about that, and I'll, we'll ask for an answer later. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about ferrites and how ferrites can help reduce that I. And we're going to talk about how to select them, how to buy them, how to configure them, and then how to apply them and where to apply them. Basically, ferrites come in <clears throat> three different shapes. One is a slip-on bead similar to a, to a, a long cylinder. Uh, the other is a snap-on bead, which snaps together and allows you to put uh, uh, cables through that have uh, plugs on them. And the other is a ring, also called a toroid. And it's usually um, wider than it is long uh, as, as compared to a bead. And there's also ferrets. Ferrets are not, but people always use the word ferret when they're talking about ferrites. And they're not, but they're very cute, but they're, they're not applicable in this case. Some of the characteristics of ferrites in general are they're cheap, they're easy to install, and they suppress RFI generally in the range from about 100 kilohertz to 2 gigahertz. That's their sweet spot. And uh, they work on all conductive paths. So that means there has to be a wire with a conductance that uh, they're, they're trying to shield. And that includes antenna feed lines, AC-DC cables, input-output cables of all different types. And we'll show you how to use, uh, use some of these on those different types of uh, the cables. There are lots of options in size, shape, and frequency range to suppress currents. And, the, and uh, see, all these may look the same. They're all little black objects, but they're different shapes. But you'll find in a second that they're all work at different frequencies. And that's important to be able to select which frequency that you want them to work at. Um, so, so let's look at some of the characteristics of a ferrite, All right? And so here's a fancy graph. And basically I'm gonna just say it in words. Ferrites are frequency, frequency dependent resistors, all right? That is to say they have different resistance at different frequencies, all right? So there's a graph here, it's a fancy looking graph with three different lines on it, four different lines on it. 
and it's impedance up the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> left-hand side and it's frequency across the bottom. And you'll see for this particular ferrite com uh, composition uh, that it gets very high uh, impedance. So that green line, for example, which is the impedance, uh, it gets very high right around 100 and 120 megahertz, something like that. That's the peak. And then it, it's, uh, it goes down to um, about 600 ohms at uh, looks like roughly 70 megahertz. In other words, that brown section in the center. So about 70 megahertz up to about uh, 200 uh, megahertz. That's its sweet spot, all right? And it works very well. It'll work a little bit on, the, on either side, but that's pr primarily the area that it'll work on. And so they're frequency dependent resistors, which means uh, again, they have a different resistance at different frequencies. And if you remember from my prior slide, where you need at least 1,000 to 500 ohms, you have to pick a ferrite, which has got at least that amount of, of uh, resistance. Uh, we're going to call impedance resistance in this case, um, because they're approximately the same. Uh, and you need at least that much uh, resistance in order to uh, uh, stop the, the, uh, the RFI currents. Okay, so how, how can this resistance be increased and how do we actually use it on a ferrite? All right, so here's an example. If you remember from uh, your fundamentals, resistors add in series. So in this case, uh, we're gonna use little beads. You see a picture of a bead here. All right, this is a picture of a bead right here. And um, that's a single bead. That, that individual bead has got a um, <clears throat> impedance of roughly 80 to 100 ohms, all right, at most frequencies below 30 megahertz. So if you put five of those in a row, all right, you put five of these little guys in a row, and this is, a, this is the line here where you'll see what their impedance is over frequency. This goes up to si about 61 megahertz and starts at one megahertz. So it's a, they're, you know, they, they, it gets a little bit higher as frequency goes up, all right? But if you put 10 beads in series, you get even more. And if you put 15 beads in series, you get even higher, all right? And you're getting up to the point where you have about 1,500 ohms here in a certain range between, it looks like about you know, 40 to 20 meters, for example. But once you get up to about 30 megahertz, no matter how many beads you have on there, it's approximately the same, the same uh, thousand ohms, all right? and uh, doesn't make too much difference because that's a characteristic of the material that we're using for this illustration. But in a lot of cases uh, for HF purposes, for example, uh, you can use uh, 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 these, these chokes. These are on pieces of coax, five beads, 10 beads, 15 beads. And they're very effective for uh, just taking uh, off some of the, um, uh, the common mode current that's on um, on the, uh, the coaxial cables and reducing the RFI that's caused by that. So you can add uh, resistance uh, by uh, putting uh, the uh, beads in series. And this is true for not only the, the snap-on beads, but the, uh, also the, uh, the beads that are, uh, that are uh, single uh, pieces. The characteristics are virtually identical for the same hole size. But there's one other very useful feature and that is if you, the, in, the ferrite uh, resistance also increases as the square of the number of turns through the center. All right, so saying that a different way and looking at the pictures on the bottom, here's an example of a single turn uh, through a ferrite and it's at seven megahertz, it's about a hundred ohms. But if I take that same, same one and I put it through three times, it's a hundred, and it's three squared, which is nine. So I get 900 ohms. If I put it through a larger ferrite, multiple turns, in this case, seven turns, I get 6,400 ohms. So you can see just for a little extra effort, we're getting a bead that's got a little bit bigger hole than the cable that you're using. You could significantly increase the resistance from any particular ferrite. And that's very handy 
and it uh, saves you a lot of money too uh, if you can do that. The, the picture on the right is a AC power cable, I think for a computer or for a lot of the devices, HDMI, H, uh, uh, HDTVs, for example. <clears throat> and this is a way to prevent uh, um, a low frequency uh, RFI from getting into your uh, TV sets that's picked up by uh, the long antennas in your house called AC power lines. So the next question you have is, okay, now we know that if we put multiple turns, it's better. If we put if we put them in series, it's better. In fact, you can put them in series with multiple turns. That's even that's even better yet. Uh, but turns turns are king. That's that's the main thing I want you to, to learn here. So how do you choose the right ferrite? All right, all the ferrites when you look at them on a table, they're all going to be the same. They look almost identical. Uh, <clears throat> there's a few subtle things like the the shape of uh, some of them may be a little bit different they may have rounded corners versus flat flat edges for example but in general they all look the same to the uh, to the untrained eye so to speak but they all have different characteristics all right so uh, the formulation of each is may be different and the combination of the ingredients in them are a little bit different so that they'll work at different frequencies all right and that's really important if you're choosing them to work at vhf because the ones that work at hf may not work at vhf and vice versa so here's a graph that shows you what they call the different mixes and mixes is just a fancy word for chemical composition and uh, Ferrite, which is the corporation, which is the one of the companies that we use, uh, has numbers which uh, typically are two digits. So uh, the red graph on the bottom is 75, mix 75, mix 31, which is real common. And uh, you see that in QST magazine all the time. Uh, mix 61, which is used quite a bit on UHF and VHF is a real uh, important one. Uh, 43 is a common one and so is uh, 46 which is uh, used a lot in Europe. But as you can see, uh, this graph shows you um, uh, the frequency range and the uh, impedance of a particular size of, uh, of bead uh, at a different range. But what it points out is, is that mix 75 is really good down, down, mix 75 is superior to anything up to about this, this point right here. And that is a one, two, three, four, about five megahertz. So anything below about five megahertz, you, you would prefer to use this one because it has more resistance than anybody, anybody else. And so what are some of the things that are below five megahertz? Well, obviously 160, 80 meters, uh, switching power supplies, inverters, uh, generators, anything that's low frequency like that would be a, a key uh, use for a, a mix 75. On the other hand, mix 31, um, the yellow line here goes all the way up to about three, almost 300 megahertz before 61 takes over. And it's fairly useful for all the different frequencies in here. All right. It can be used at the low frequencies, but it's not nearly as effective as mix 75. Uh, mix 43 has been around since the 1940s. It's a very old mix and uh, still very useful. Uh, one of the things that you'll find is, though, it is made in every shape and form that you can think of. And some of the other mixes do not come in those shapes and are not quite as useful. So uh, the key thing here is, is when you're dealing with interferences, you have to um, uh, use the, a ferrite that is effective at the fundamental frequency of the interference not particularly the frequency that you're hearing on the receiver because you may be hearing of a, a uh, uh, harmonic. So you would use, uh, as an example, uh, mix 75 for, for 100 kilohertz to five megahertz, mix 31 for one to 300, 43 from 23 to 250, and mix 61 for 20 to 200, all right? That's the official uh, uh, ranges for, for those mixes. And when you're when you're utilizing them, you have to be able to know which ferrite you're using. Now I'm going to tell you something here that you're you don't normally hear, and that's how not to buy ferrites. Okay, because this this is this is a real simple way that you may fall into. There's a lot of uh, ads on eBay, on Craigslist, on all these different websites, even Amazon, and they look similar to the one on the left hand side here. It says. Buy this pack of 20 for 
of ferrites and they'll solve all your RFI problems. There's only one major problem with this. And it's, it's also indicative of, um, of ferrites that you see at swap meets. Here's one ferrites, a dollar, take your pick, anyone you want in the box. Some of these aren't even ferrites, they're iron powder ones, by the way, uh, the yellow and the red ones. Yeah, but it's typical of, the, of what I'm trying to make the point is here. There's no mixed designation. There's no identification. There's no resistance or impedance range. There's no frequency range. You have no idea what you're buying. It's like buying a resistor without a color code on it. It's a resistor, but it, you know, have no idea what the resistance is or whether it's good for what you want it to use it for. So my point is avoid those because they're useless and you're just wasting your money on that. An alternative, which we, we, we like to uh, show is that, and we're not the only people that do this by the way, but the, the, point, is, the, the point is that you, you have to be aware of what you're buying. All of our uh, ferrites come with um, an identification of what the RFI range is. In this case, one to 300, uh, what the size is, it's mixed 31, it's a half inch and you get 10 in this particular box. And this is the resistance for one turn for this particular size at all different frequencies up to 250 megahertz. So if you had a, a two meter uh, RFI issue at 144 megahertz and um, your um, uh, rule of thumb is you need about a thousand ohms, you would need four of these uh, snap-ons in a row on a cable um, uh, and that would solve that would solve your RFI problems because that that would meet the uh, thousand ohm uh, uh, capability. All right, so let's recap what I've just told you in, in one slide, and then we'll go on to some actual practical uses of this. Now that you know some of the the fundamentals about uh, ferrites. So the first thing is you have to determine the RFI interfering frequency and the suspected path. And by the way, you may have more than one path. You may have interference coming in multiple ways through the AC power line, through radiation that's getting into another cable or something like that. And then you need to choose the proper mix. And basically the, the mixes we've talked about are 31, 43, 61, 75 to suppress the RFI fundamental frequency. And then choose the topology, the shape that'll fit the cable that you're using. And you want it to fit the path or uh, either on a single turn or multiple turns. Sometimes you have to get a really big uh, ring in order to fit large plugs through, uh, for example, on generators and things like that. And we'll show you some examples of that in a second. Install the ferrites on the path and then retest to make sure that they're working correctly. Sometimes you put them on the wrong cable and then there's no difference. So you have to put them on the correct cable. And by the way, you can put multiple cables that do different functions on the same ferrite. And we'll show you why that's, that's the case in a second. Uh, an example would be a DC cable and a USB cable going through the same ferrite. That's okay, there's no problem doing that. Consider additional ferrites or paths if the RFI still persists. The most popular one you'll see in, in all the magazines is Mix 31. However, Mix 75 is one of our biggest sellers because of all the issues that are happening below a couple megahertz because of switching power supplies and variable speed motors and all kind of LED lights, all that type of stuff is typically below a megahertz. Okay. So how and where do you put the ferrite filter for transmitter RFI? So the next couple of sections, one's gonna go over transmitter RFI and the other one, the next one after that will go over receive RFI in terms of getting rid of some of the noise that you're hearing. But first of all, let's talk about uh, uh, transmitter RFI. There's basically three things we'll talk about. One is uh, you can uh, either buy RFI kits, you can do it yourself. There's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, you can um, also minimize your uh, coax cable radiation on HF and DHF, and every coax fed antenna needs a choke, uh, at least at the feed point, unless, you, unless it's got a quarter wave transformer on it. Uh, you need to have one of those, otherwise your, your antenna becomes, uh, your coax becomes part of the antenna. And then you can install still solution specific kits for, uh, for typical victims uh, from your transmit RFI. So the first thing is, let's talk a little bit about uh, any type of transceiver, uh, any frequency, and any amplifiers that may be attached to those things. Um, your transmitter amplifier uh, antenna RFI suppression, you need to choke all the cables in and out of the radios, basically. That includes the amplifiers, antenna tuners, 
Uh, also, all coax lines, rotor cables, AC-DC power lines, including wall warts, especially wall warts. Uh, in fact, we have a special product just for wall warts uh, because they're, su they're such a noise generator. Uh, quite often, uh, they're a type, of type accepted in the United States. Components are taken out of them when they're actually put into manufacturing, and they're just noisier than heck uh, when they're actually distributed in this country. And particularly if you're buying them off of eBay or Amazon where they're shipped from China, it's a major, major problem. Uh, computer all radio all radio interconnects to computers, including the AC power line, will have amazing effects on on quieting you know, not only your radio but uh, also preventing RFI back into those things. Now we'll give you some examples on the next slide slides here. So here's an example. This is a very popular this is ICOM seventy three hundred. This is the back of it, for example. This is one of the kits that we sell, but it's applicable to any type of transceiver. Uh, we have snap-ons here on the USB cables, uh, the uh, transmit receive uh, cables, and some other control cables down here. And then we also have a ring over here, uh, which is effective on the coax cable. You can see it here. And then we also have one on the DC switching power supply or the linear power supply. It doesn't make any difference, but works better on switching power supplies because they have more spikes in them. Uh, but what this does is it filters out some of the RFI that's getting into or coming back out through uh, the DC power supply. And I, sh I should tell you, transmitters, no matter what they are, all the power does not go out the coax cable. All right. Well, some of it will leak through because of common grounds into other cables. And it'll actually, you'll get transmitted RFI coming out some of these other things too. All right. You can get a little bit fancier and we can put actually a coax noise filter in here instead of a, a ring, uh, but the ring suffices in a lot of the cases, but in some cases, tough cases, we actually put a multiple ring, uh, multiple uh, mix uh, filter in here that significantly cuts it down. And we'll show you that when we get to the, um, uh, the receive RFI issues. It's amazing. You can cut down some of the noise in these radios by almost uh, six S units six to eight S units. If you have a linear amplifier, uh, it doesn't make any difference what frequency it is. Uh, typically you would put a ferrite uh, kit on the AC power line, uh, the coax in, out. Uh, if there's a push to talk line, you're gonna put one here and also on the, um, the, uh, the RF input. So it only takes four in this case. In this case, it's a large uh, one inch uh, uh, split, uh, split uh, bead up here, another split bead for the uh, RF out, and a ring for the RF in, and then a small snap on for the push to talk line. This is, this is an Ameritron 811, this is the SB220, but uh, virtually all the amplifiers are, this, are, are the same, except the real fancy ones, which have multiple cables coming out the back for RF output and those types of things. And they just need additional uh, filters, but the principle is the same. So the, in order to, to solve these types of problems that you're causing RFI, you have to basically uh, put RFI filters on your, your equipment first uh, at the equipment uh, side uh, before you um, uh, attempt to uh, solve a victim that you're getting into. Let's talk a little bit about um, coax lines. You wanna stop the, the, the transmit RF current on a coax braid. So I'm just gonna tell you that all coax fed antennas need a feed point choke at the antenna feed point. If you don't do that, here's what happens. Your dipole becomes a tripole, your unipole or vertical will become a dipole and your coax will radiate, causing potentially causing local RFI. All right, so why, why do I make that statement? Here's the, here's the uh, answer. Coax fed antennas um, can, act as uh, part of the antenna, the coax can act as part of the antennas for the following reason. Coax has three electrical conductors, all right? Most people know that, but if you don't know it, this is a quick recap. Uh, the, the outside piece of metal, the shield is actually one piece of metal, but there's a current that flows inside the shield and there's a current that flows outside the shield and they're completely separate, all right? And the one that's outside the shield is called the common mode current. So let's just follow this diagram. If you have a transmitter down here, this is the little symbol for a transmitter. It's transmitting 
uh, either up or down, depending upon the phase. It's transmitting a signal and it goes to half of a dipole antenna here. The other part of the signal is, is, is put up from the ground here, it goes to the shield and it goes inside and it goes it goes up to the dipole, but it's got a, it, there's a fork in the road here. The fork in the road says, do I go back down this way? Do I go out this way? Or do I split it between the two? And it will split it depending upon what the impedance is. So in a typical dipole, it's 25 ohms on each side if it's a 50 ohm dipole, for example. So if the impedance down here is, you know, uh, uh, 40 ohms, or, or, or even if it's 20, if it was 25 ohms, then the, the, the current would actually split. You'd have half the current going here, you'd have half the current going down here, and you would effectively have this as part of your antenna. So if you, if we make the assumption that this is relatively high impedance here, so that most of the current goes out here, even if you had 1% going down here, all right, you would have uh, almost uh, three watts coming down here if you're running full legal limit or a half a watt if you're only running 100, 100 uh, watts of, uh, of input power here. Well, that's enough if it's running through your attic, that coax, understand, that coax is going to transmit all the way back to your radio, all right? And as a result, that can interfere with a whole variety of different things because typically your coax is closer to uh, electronic things in your house than your antenna is. And as a result, um, not only could you get, possibly get RFI from your antenna, but your coax becomes a real issue. So the way to stop that is you put a little stop sign here right at the, um, uh, at the, uh, the junction to make sure that all the power stays on the antenna during transmit, all right? So how do you, how do, you do that? I'll give you one more example. This is an example of putting a stop sign here right at the transmit. So instead of having your coax radiate RFI all the way back to the radio, you put a stop sign here and it gets rid of all this radiated RFI. Now, this is a kind of a precursor to the next section is just the opposite thing happens on receive. You have all these devices out here creating RFI and guess what? Your coax all the way from, even, even if, you, if you do or do, don't have a choke here, all your coax, that remember, you've got another receive antenna called the outside of the coax. And when you screw in your coax connector, the inside of the braid and the outside of the braid connect together and you in effect have two receive antennas. So you would put another very high choke down here to stop the receive RFI that you're getting into your radio, you put a choke up here to stop the transmit RFI and to make sure it stays on your transmitter. Two completely different functions and two completely different reasons to use chokes on a, on a coax line. This is true of any frequency and, and uh, any length of coax in general. So what are some of the technical requirements for these types of chokes, all right? Generally, and here's a, here's a, I'm going to give you two, two sets of graphs because it says it in two different ways. Generally, you want a choke that's designed, in this case, we got one megahertz here, we got 30 megahertz here. You want a choke that works across the whole spectrum, all right? Not one that just works across part of the spectrum. So we design ours so that they have about, in this case, 5,000 ohms across the entire spectrum, all right? This is our high frequency one over here, our high powered one also, and it goes from one megahertz to 61 megahertz, all five or se about 7,000 ohms here, all the way out to, to six, past six meters. Very effective choke, all right? In fact, I can't keep these in stock, but I, I sell them out so quickly. And uh, we even put a static bleeder in here. It takes off the static off the center line. It goes to ground too. Now you can take these same graphs that, graphs that are in resistance and I'm going to put them in um, common mode uh, common mode rejection ratio, which is more applicable to understanding their real effect. All right, so this this choke here and this graph is exactly the same as the other one, just expressed in a different ratio. This is how much dB suppression of the of the current on the outside of the braid is. 
In this case, it's 38 dB. All right, so if you were to use this on your receiver end of it, 38 dB, and there's six dBs per S unit, right? 38 into six is approximately six S units of common mode noise disappears. All right, and I'll, I'll show you in a second how to test for that, whether you have common mode noise or whether it's actually antenna noise. This joke here is 49 dB, right? Think about it. That's, a, that's, that's more than eight S units of, of reduction in, at the transmit level, but also at the receive level too. And so a lot of guys will run these uh, on both ends of the coax and they're, they're just extremely happy with the results of those things. Don't buy chokes without specs. The same goes for ferrites, all right? Unless you know the frequency range that they're good for and you know the either the, either the resistance, either the specs are given in ohms like this in resistance or the specs are giving in suppression of the common mode current. If, if you don't have that over the frequency range uh, that you're interested in, then that choke is not worth buying because they haven't done their homework. And you don't and you don't want to buy something that that you that may or may not work. All right. If you buy anything from MFJ, there are no specs. I'll just tell you, most manufacturers have no specs on them. If you look at our little charts here, they all say minus, you know, minus 35 dB. In fact, all of our products on our website also have all these charts associated with every one of them. So you know whether they're going to work for you or not. These also come in VHF and UHF versions, by the way, uh, for both the small ones and the large ones. These are 500 watt ones. These are 3KW ones. Okay, there's some simple ones that you can do by yourself too that are very inexpensive. These are, this is a $10 ring. This is an example on a dipole. So we have a dipole here with you know, two sides and we have a simple choke here. The chokes, one-to-one -one chokes are also called one-to-one -one balance, by the way, it's the, same, it's, a word, it's the same word for the same thing. And so this is an example of one with uh, one, two, three, four, five turns through it, all right? And it provides a certain amount of uh, choking. Uh, this is a choke that we sell through HRO, which has got 10 turns on it, uh, roughly 32 dB. It's about a $30 product. And you can just put that in series with your radio and bingo, you've just dropped, uh, you know, five S units of noise. Not bad, not bad for 30 bucks. Okay, multi-bead chokes. Again, uh, we talked a little bit about these before. We showed you a graph before, but here's a graph that goes out to six meters and there's similar ones for VHF and UHF. And there's really, there's really no practical difference. A lot of people ask me, is there a practical difference between the ones that snap open and the ones that slip on? The answer is no. They're, they're, they're within 95% of each other. And so when you, when you look at uh, five beads in a row or 10 beads or 15 beads, you can still get you know, roughly 20, 26 dB, which is, uh, like I say, 4S units of noise reduction or significant reduction when you use it at the uh, transmit end for a... Uh, uh, at the antenna end uh, for uh, uh, for RFI from uh, transmit uh, uh, transmitting. So these are the typical uh, uh, in, these, and these are all our website too. I'm just giving you some some examples as principles of of how to use these. You can. Um, this is an example here of again five, ten, fifteen beads. Remember the seventy fives? I said they're much better. And here's actually the graphs of the seventy fives. All right, so if you have AM broadcast uh, interference, for example, all right, uh, this is that you would use a 15 beads here and you'd get, uh, uh, just by looking at about minus 20, uh, 20, 22 dB of uh, rejection of AM broadcast, all right? So if you're a low band operator, let's go back one, oops. If you're a low band operator and you got AM broadcast interference or you have 160 meter issues, then you would use this one here. But of uh, uh, past about uh, 160 meter band, uh, the, this this one here is that these these beads here uh, are actually a little bit better for suppression. Mix 75 is is about 10 dB better up to about up to about the 80 meter band actually. So just an example of the difference of those. Okay, so, so you want to install in solution specific RFI victim kits. Your neighbor can have a, their own strategy, by the way, and that is just to choke you instead of cho you choking the electronic device. Uh, your ham strategy is a little bit different, however. 
So what you want to do is be a little bit smarter. You have to know the source, the path, and the victim. Obviously, if you're the source and you're transmitting, you know who the, you know who the source is. And the question is, how's it, how's it getting to your neighbor or inside your house? Same thing. You have to clean up your, your track, your transmitter, and your shack first, like we already discussed with the kits. And then you have to assess the neighbor's problem. The faulty device, the device that's acting as a receiver when which when it's not designed to be a radio receiver, uh, in other words, a telephone or HDTV, all right, it may be faulty. I mean, it just may be a bad device. You may have a, uh, and it has nothing to do with you. Determine the frequency of the transmitter that is causing the problem. It may not be in all bands and it may not even be you. It may be a guy with a, a noisy solar system on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the, of your neighbor, for example. Try and find the path to the victim. Choose an RF choke. Uh, for the path, and then actually put that put that in the path and see if see if it works. All right. A lot of these things have already been pre worked out for you, and we have we have we have over 500 products, but we have a lot of them that are just specific. So we have a home theater RFI kit, for example, which consists of rings and also uh, snap ons for different types of. Uh, uh, of inputs and outputs on your hi-fi systems. Uh, computer RFI, we have laptop, assist, laptop systems. Uh, we have router systems. Um, alarm systems are a big deal. Smoke alarms these days in houses, that are, which is a requirement in California, are always going off because of transmitters. Uh, miscellaneous RFI, a, a lot of the low frequency stuff comes into the AC power line. So, you know, 80% of the time, if you put a uh, filter on your AC power line, you'll, you'll solve that problem. Uh, we talked about garage doors before. The, here's, here's the filter on the AC to the garage door, but also the control lines for the garage doors when they open and shut with the garage door, the little sensor lines. Those are the ones that actually go off the most. So there are kits for all these specific things, and this is six of them, and there's probably another hundred of them in there for, for different types of things. We have sprinklers and you name it. We've been through so many different, different types of devices that uh, we have one for LED lights now. You put new LED lights in your shack, and you can't even hear anything on the low bands anymore. That's a problem. Um, so just to recap, determine the frequency, install the kits. Uh, install a feed line choke and all your and all your antenna coax feed lines. And install AC/DC uh, filters uh, on your AC/DC lines, and con consider additional ones. If you need help, you can always call us, drop us an email. Uh, there's lots of tech support on the website too. So let's talk a little bit about receiver noise. Talk about two basic things. One's called the coax noise filter, and how to how to suppress some of the noise that's coming in on those. Again, you want to uh, when you have when you're dealing with receiver noise, the strategy is the same as when you're dealing with transmitter noise. It's just on the other side of the, the equation. So you you have to look at the source, the path, the victim for the RFI. You or somebody else is the source. Who's the source? And, and if you can shut down the source, that's always preferable. In a lot of cases, you can't. In California, we have a lot of people running grow lights in their houses these days. They're, they're growing everything you can think of. It's legal now. And grow light halogens are just terrific uh, noise generators, right? And uh, that may be the source, but there's not much you can generally do about it. You have to protect your own self, which is your receiver, from their noise sources. Solar systems are the same way. If the noise goes off at nighttime, but it's on during the day, it's usually a solar system causing that or something that has to do with uh, uh, people watching TV or, or, or running something during the day. Uh, protect your victim, which is your receiver. Uh, coax noise filters on feed lines will do that. Ferrites on rotor lines will do that. Uh, ferrites on AC, DC cords, wall warts, uh, ring or snap-on filters. We'll show you some examples of that. Uh, ferrites on the radio and the computer interconnect cables. A lot of times, a lot of people are running FT8 uh, you know, digital modes these days. About 80% of the hams are, it turns out. And uh, their computer uh, computers and their power supplies and their computers are causing issues with uh, noise on their, uh, on their USB cables into their radios. That can, simply, that can be eliminated virtually 100% by using a ferrite uh, uh, choke on that, that particular cable. Eliminate or isolate the source, uh, choke the power to those sources, 
because they may be going uh, <clears throat> from the AC back into the AC power line and also may be going uh, through the the, uh, the DC to the uh, particular device. Call us if you get if you get um, stuck. Now I'm going to show you a, a real simple test here to see if you have uh, this type of noise. I'll make a general statement. Uh, noise, noise on coax cables can come either down the center of the cable or it can be coming on the outside of the cable from that extra third conductor. And there's a simple way for you to test for that. One way is to just take your radio and unplug the coax 100%. Don't even plug it in and see if the noise goes away 100%. If it all goes away, then you know that the noise is coming down the coax cable. In some cases, it doesn't all go away. It's actually come, some of it's coming into the power supply. And in that case, you need to look at the power supply and uh, its cable and make sure that you have some filters on that so that it's not getting into the radio. It also may be coming in through the computer, through a USB cable. So you have to look at that. So eliminating this uh, uh, as a source is the first thing you want to do. For, you have to know which wire it's coming in on, and it may be coming in on multiple wires. But let's say you, you, you take out the cable and all the noise goes away. So now we have to determine where is the noise coming down the center or is it coming on the outside? Here's a simple way to do it. Just plug in the center pin. Do not let it touch the outside. So there's an example right here in left-hand picture. Uh, the center pin is plugged in. And then, and then just look at your S meter, see what it is. And it may be different on different bands, by the way. You may have a lot of noise on low bands versus high bands and those types of things, but to check and see um, uh, if you have any noise based upon the um, only the center pin. And then the next step, measure that level. Let's say it's an S3. Now screw in the outside and see if it jumps up. If it jumps up, then a ferrite filter will get rid of that jump up portion. It will not get rid of the signal that's coming down the center because it can't tell whether that's a real signal or it's a noise signal, All right? But if it does jump up, then a ferrite filter here will definitely get rid of that difference, all right? If, if there is no difference, then a ferrite filter won't do any good at all. And the problem is, is a source that's getting into the antenna itself, all right? And so either you have to re, either have to find the source and stop that or suppress it, or you have to move your antenna or do something like that because a ferrite filter is not going to do you any good at all. And that was the same principle we saw in the picture before. You put a you put a, a choke down here at the radio to get rid of all of the current that's being induced into the outside of the braid coming into your radio. All right. So where do you install this thing? And now I'm going to give you another little uh, <coughs> word of wisdom here after we go through this thing. And it has to do with antenna switches, all right? So here's a diagram. You have a transceiver, you have a linear amplifier, an antenna tuner, antenna switch, and then you have uh, three antennas out here. You're typically, you, you have a switch similar to this one with you know three or four uh, prongs on it, and you have three or four antennas on it. And the, 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 the principle is, is you're gonna put a choke up here to make sure that the transmit re, uh, uh, RFI or the transmit signal stays on the antenna. And then you're also going to need to put a choke here on each one of the, the cables before it gets into the antenna switch. All right. I'll explain that in a second. And then, of course, you want to make sure everything's grounded to a single point. And in some cases, you'll need to put another choke in between your transceiver and your linear amplifier because there's some noise that may be coming back through here uh, on your linear amplifier and RFI uh, also. Okay, so let's look at the antenna switch problem. All right, most antenna switches, and there's only a couple on the market right now that don't do this. Most antenna switches share a common uh, 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 ground for all of the antennas. Uh, in other words, all the shields of all the antennas that you hook into your antenna switch are all hooked together. All right. If they're all hooked together, the only thing that you're switching with the antenna switch is the center conductor. So if you have, in this case, uh, uh, here's a simple example. You have two antennas. If, if I don't have these filters in here, this antenna is hooked directly to the switch. So the question is, if this is the common, 
how many receive antennas do I have? Well, I have the shield of antenna one, I have the shield of antenna two, and I have the center of either whichever one I've selected. At any one time, I have three receive antennas. If I have, you know, if I have uh, five antennas on here at any one time, I have six receive antennas at one time. All right. And so, and, and I found this even in my installation. I have, you know, I have three acres here and I have antennas all over the property. And I have found that if I'm listening to my log periodic on the far end of the uh, property, I may be getting noise on the shield of the antenna that's on the other side of the property because that's where my neighbor's solar system is, okay? And so what you have to do is you have to isolate all the shields and you do that with a, a felt, a choke, a really high impedance choke. We call them coax noise filters prior to them getting into the switch. So that isolates all the shields so that the shield of one is not affecting the shield of the other, which is not affecting the antenna that you've hooked it to. All right, that's a really big deal if you're using antenna switches and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see an enormous difference. If you just take the filter and you put it in the common line, you're then listening to all the shields of all the other, other ones because the shield and the inside of the coax um, shield, which is the uh, receive signal, they're all connected in parallel. All right. Okay. Different types of filters that you can use. You can use the simple beads. They provide about 500 to 1,000 ohms. If you use the choke with multiple turns, remember multiple turns is king. Uh, they're only a couple dollars more, but they provide 1,000 to 2,000 ohms. And if you have the little box here, uh, that's 2,000 to 6,000 ohms, depending upon the frequency. So, and these, uh, and so you can choose which one you need for, for different installations. There's also one more on here, which is the 3KW one, which is typically used on the outside of transmitters and things like that. And again, we have these for all frequency ranges up to 500 megahertz. They're just different mixes of, of uh, cables for different, different applications, different frequency ranges. Uh, here's the box ones. We have them in boxes. We have them in small boxes. We have them in tubes for beams. We have all different types. Typically about not quite 40 dB. That's about six S units of noise reduction. Once you get past the noise reduction on the coax line, there's obviously other things that cause noise. And uh, AC-DC power lines are those types. Here's one, we've seen this picture before. This is an AC, AC line. This is a large, we, the rings are made up to three inches in diameter. So this is a very large one. I think it's got uh, four out wire on it. Uh, for This was in a boating. And I had a big boat at one point in my life. And this was uh, one of the rings that we used for the inverter power supplies. Uh, this is uh, one inch ones. They're used for with large plugs, all right? And this is two in series, three turns each. And this is a plug for like a generator. Uh, you don't want to take the plug off, so you just put multiple turns through here and they're, they're really useful for uh, generators. Uh, for switch mode power supplies, this is a mix 75. We use one on the DC and we use one on the coax over here. And that usually solves a problem. In fact, we have a kit called a switch mode power supply kit, which is these two in, in a box. And uh, they're sold through HRO and we sell them direct also. But they're, uh, we use mix 75 because most switching power supplies are below, below a megahertz. And that's where these, these shine. Uh, we also use this, a similar product on wall warts. It's just a smaller ring. And the ring is typically put right here on the, um, right before it goes into the, to, the, to the device for a couple purposes. It stops the, uh, uh, the interference going into the device, but more impo also importantly, it stops any noise that's coming out of the device from going back into the power supply, going back into your AC, AC lines, because that noise is typically low frequency. Low frequency likes large antennas. AC power lines work as large antennas. If you're using a whole bunch of wall warts, plug them into a, uh, to an AC power strip and then put a big ring on the common of the AC power strip, and that will help it from getting back into the uh, into the wall and through uh, the rest of your uh, your uh, power power supplies, your AC lines. 
if you're brand new to this to ferrites, you don't really know what I've been talking about so far, I'll give you a couple of hints on what's the most popular thing if you're going to buy any ferrites at all, is buy the Mix 31 rings, all right? Uh, and uh, with like all of our products, if you buy nine, you get one free in general. And uh, you know, buy, buy 10 of the rings and then put those on the different uh, pieces that you have or buy, or buy the, uh, the, the kits that are already designed for it. The other most popular one are the half-inch snap-ons. And uh, we have combination kits of these and different frequencies and different ranges too. And uh, because you're because you may be a newbie, you can use the newbie uh, discount code. You always get ten percent off. That's good till the end of the year. And just type in the word N E W B I E. And for anything you buy between now and uh, uh, the end of the year, you get ten percent off. All right, I'm going to give you a quick uh, a quick little test here. See if you've been paying attention. And uh, uh, there's four questions here. What's the, what, what are the two best ways to increase the choking resistance of a ferrite filter? All right. Use high resistance wire in multiple turns on the bead. Uh, part of that's right. Use multiple turns and double shield coax. All right. Double shield coax does not do any good, by the way, because the outside shield still conducts the current. Doesn't make a difference if it's triple shielded. That outside shield is always the problem. The outside of the shield conducts its own current. Uh, use multiple beads in series with multiple turns. Well, that's a pretty good answer. Use mix 31 and mix 75 beads in series with a single turn. Well, in general, you can expand, uh, just, uh, just to expand on that, on that answer, you can use different mixes on the same cable and it will expand the frequency, all right? But you should always do it with more than a single turn if you can, all right? The best answer for this one is, uh, is answer number C, use multiple beads in series and multiple turns. And uh, you can also use multiple mixes and multiple beads and multiple turns, and that will spread out that the uh, frequency spectrum significantly. Uh, question number two: Mix sixty-one is used in which frequency range? This is this should be uh, this is the, the mix that you would use in most of your Papa systems, I would assume, uh, because you're in those frequency ranges. And the answer is uh, two hundred to, to two gigahertz. That's the mix sixty-one is ideal for that range. And in fact, you would for a, for a typical VHF or UHF, you would need four of those beads at the um, uh, the feed point of your antennas, and that would be that would keep the, uh, uh, your antennas uh, coax from radiating, and vice versa for the um, uh, for the radios uh, for the receive end. What's one of the best kept secrets in ham radio? Uh, ladder line is more lost than coax. No. Uh, coax wound choke can cover all frequencies from 160 meters if the coax is long enough. One of the things we didn't talk about was if you're using coax as a, as a choke. A coax as a choke, a lot of people say, we'll just take a, a, a round tube, uh, a PVC and wrap a number of turns of coax around it and you have a choke. The problem is, is that choke only works at one frequency. It's a tuned choke. It's a parallel tuned circuit. And a parallel tuned circuit, yes, has a high impedance and it will work at one frequency. So you could make one of those chokes, but it has to be tuned to the frequency that you're using. If it's not, they're useless. All right. Or saying in a different way, they'll only work on one frequency and all the other frequencies they won't work on at all. So if you had a 40 meter vertical or, or a, a two meter antenna, yes, you could design one for that. But frankly, it's easier just to snap on three snap ons than it is to wind the choke and get the form and all that kind of stuff. OK, uh, answer number C, all ferrites work on all frequencies. So buy the cheapest one. OK, yeah, go to Amazon and buy something without any specs on it and it won't work for, at all for you. D, as coax noise filters reduce common mode noise level in your receiver so you can hear more stations. And E, all extra class ha uh, hams go to heaven. Well, I know D is right, and I hope, I hope uh, E is right also. All right, one last question ended up, which company is your best source for RFI solutions? I think you already know the answer to that one. And after that, I am done and I am open for questions. And uh, if you have any, I'll be glad to, uh, to answer them. So you guys are on. I'm off. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bob. I know there's a bunch of questions. Uh, let's see what's happening here with our, our view. Let's go to gallery view here. Okay. Um, I, I think Ron had a hand up. Ron, go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, can you hear me? I got a headset. I'm not sure if it's working. Yep, you're you're just fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is this, and it's probably a stupid question, but um, sometimes we get interference from really powerful military uh, RFI. Are there any filter, and it like obliterates our signals completely. Are there any filters that would work with that? Uh, do you know what the frequencies of those are? I do not. And uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how you hear the RFI. Yeah, that's a, uh, what he's talking about is radar coming radar. in on, on, on the primary frequency. So, you know, that's coming down your antenna, not on the braid. Yeah, it's probably probably on your antenna, you're right. Yeah, so the answer is to go to 220. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, you, you can put a frequency selective uh, filter in there, too. That's another way to do it. But, but the frequency is the is the four is UHF for yeah. band. So yeah. it doesn't you know we're we're sharing 440 with the military. Okay, I got you. Getting on 440, there's no way to filter that out if you're listening on 440. Thank you. You're hired, Dave. <laughs> well, I've listened to you a lot. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Tim, go ahead. Yes. Hi. I um just a unique situation I have. I have a powered uh, Bose speakers in, near my computer and I I wrapped uh, with some of your cores, both the uh, the audio cable between the speakers and the power going into it. And every time I key out, it makes a bzzz. <laughs> so I was, what would you recommend for uh, trying what, to- uh, Yeah, what frequency are you keying up on? Usually 144. -ish. All right, so typically that's a short antenna that it's getting into. Uh, it, uh, it may not be getting into the speakers, it may be getting in, into the computer that the speakers are hooked to. And you're hearing it on the speakers. Is that possible? I'm not sure. I, I, yeah, it could be. Yeah, I, I have to say, yeah, I guess it could be. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I've been, I've been noodling with it, and busting my back going to get underneath my desk over and over and over again trying to wrap these things but uh, man no luck so yeah so are, are the are the boses directly hooked to the radio or are they just hooked to the uh, no, no just uh I, it's my computer desk here has got the rate you know got a handheld here yeah just a you know three and a half millimeter goes into the computer and then the bose speakers got power and they're powered so they they're got their own internal power so and then there's just a wire that goes in between the two so it's kind of like yeah, generally it is it is the power that's causing it, typically on 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 uh, HF, uh, but it also may be that it's actually getting into your computer, and the symptom that you're hearing is the audio being distorted in your computer. Um, it'd be simple to to test that. Just un, just unhook the uh, the Bose speaker and see if your if your computer speaker is doing the same thing. Yep. If uh, it is, then you know it's getting into the computer, and all you're doing is amplifying the the problem that's that's in your computer. And that 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 the type of the mix would be um, for this for this frequency would the best one would be let me look at my notes. Uh, according to your slide, it's going to be the thirty-one mix. Yeah, thirty-one would be fine for that. Yeah. Perfect. By the way, by the I, way, this presentation is also on the website as well as a PDF of the thing too. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's where I, I got it. I always got to refer to that PDF, and I thought I was getting clever with it, but I can't solve it. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you. I think Bert had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Bert. No, it's Bart. 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 Yeah, so actually, I've got two questions. I've got two problems. One's been a really long issue. I can't go on 40 meters. In fact, my 40 meter inverted V is uh, I'm uh, currently using the coax from it uh, for another antenna uh, because of interference to my neighbor. <clears throat> Originally, uh, back in the day, she had an NTSC TV. So uh, I put filters on it, <clears throat> excuse me, and the filters uh, worked fine. Then she had her house remodeled, including adding a second floor to it. Uh, had all of the uh, TV wiring put into the walls 
and she got uh, what at the time was a new plasma TV. Uh, couldn't filter that thing. So to keep uh, from uh, uh, having neighbor problems, uh, I, you know, basically uh, uh, disabled the uh, inverted V. The ends of it were disconnected. They're hanging uh, uh, alongside the tower and the, uh, 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 the uh, what do you call it? The ballon is still up there with the wires connected to it. I'd like to be able to get on 40 meters again. <clears throat> uh, what would you recommend? Is there a way to uh, uh, filter things uh, adequately so I don't have to uh, uh, worry about the fact that uh, uh, we can't filter her TV set? Oh, and by the way, the other thing is that because of um, the layout of the land, the size of the land, there was only one place I could put the tower. And that means that the tower uh, sits approximately 30 feet uh, from uh, the wall on which the TV uh, is on. When you filtered her TV, what did you use? Uh, I used uh, 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 fair, uh, uh, the um, toroid coils and uh, I, oh, I remember too. I also, in those days, you could buy a uh, uh, high pass filters uh, from, uh, uh, you know, very, from uh, various, I forgot where I got. Yep. yep. And uh, I also, on uh, my uh, uh, tra Drake transmitter, which uh, uh, right now is out for repair, I have an EF Johnson low pass filter. Uh, my new flex radio, uh, it has, uh, uh, the filtering built into it. So is she uh, receiving antennas over the air on a satellite? Or how, how is she actually getting the signal? Uh, originally, when we uh, when she added things, there it was satellite. But right now, uh, I don't know if she's receiving it on cable now or if she's receiving it on satellite. Well, I would say... Um, it's a filter, it, you know, the uh, filters could fix that problem if it's getting in uh, via the satellite cable, because the cable, the satellite cable's got an outside shield. That's a problem usually. It's usually not a problem with the antenna part, but the, it's the shield that fixes that. Um, if they're, if she's getting it when you're, when she's on the internet uh, TV, which most, a lot of them are now, that's a different issue. And that's usually, uh, if it's hardwired, the ethernet cable, or if, or if it's wireless, it's usually getting into the router and then the router's transmitting it over there. And it's like, it's like the Bose uh, uh, picture thing. Uh, I mean, the Bose uh, speaker thing. The, the problem is, in, is, is not necessarily in the TV, it's how it's getting to the TV, for example. And so uh, I, I would say it, it's still a solvable problem. Uh, you are close to it, and uh, uh, I would I would still uh, I would take all the wires going into that TV, and I'd make sure that uh, that they have uh, at least um, a ring on the AC power lines. But all because your your problem is generally coming in on the AC power lines because that's the longest antenna in the house. The short ones uh, or the uh, uh, the uh, satellite feed. Oh, either one of those two. But again, if you wrap if you wrap the coax in the in the rings for those, for the AC power lines and also for the uh, uh, the other ones, that could solve that. Uh, I'm not sure actually I, I, whether I uh, <clears throat> even addressed the power line at that time. But I I think the logical thing is I want to make sure that the antenna, uh, you know, is uh, clean. If I you know if I uh, uh, go to the uh, expense of investing in new uh, coax and everything. Coax has become very expensive if you haven't noticed lately. And um, so I want to make sure that uh, I've got everything I can do to make sure that the uh, uh, nothing is uh, radiating there. Is the ballon for uh, the um, dipole, is that ballon sufficient or do I need uh, uh, the um, uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, the line choke. Yeah, the, the balance choke. is not sufficient. Do I need that in addition to the balance, or is the balance uh, sufficient? Yeah, the balance is not sufficient. You need you need a line choke at both ends at the at the 
at the radio and at the feed point to the antenna. Uh, that's what was covered. Yeah, and does the does the balance say Palomar engineers on it? Uh, no, it's a it's I think it was a W two A U balance. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that is a piece of information itself because you didn't address uh, an antenna with the. Uh, uh, a balun on it. Yeah, that was yeah. Something. A one-to-one -one balun and a choke are identical. By the way, it's just a matter of what they call them. I think. Uh -huh. What did Ron? Did you have, did you have a, uh, a comment on that, Ron? Okay. No, I, I I will say okay. that Palomar has a has a balun with a a line choke built in, two in one. Yeah. It's very popular. It's a three kilowatt uh, balun plus choke. Uh, that's a very, very popular option it's at your uh, feed point of your of your dipole. Um, I don't have the part number, but uh, I was tempted to get that one. I went with a 5K ballon um, and a separate choke, but uh, that's me. <laughs> okay, that uh, gives me a place to start. Now, the other problem I'm having <clears throat> is uh, I'm having uh, interference at... Uh, uh, 14198 uh, from my own uh, uh, solar panel uh, system. And I'm wondering uh, what's the best way to uh, handle that? Um, the best way to, the, the, the proper way to handle that is to um, put the um, filters on every one of the panels because that's the problem. The problem is, is they wire these in what they call strings, which is basically a big loop antenna. And uh, either they have micro inverters or power uh, optimizers on each one of them, which, is, uh, which in effect are individual transmitters. And those individual transmitters then are in a big loop antenna. And that loop antenna, when it's turned on, just interferes with everything you can think of. I can get them almost uh, th uh, two miles away from my house. I can receive those things and I can direction find and tell you exactly where they are. And uh, it's it's a problem. And the, the, the proper way to do that is to, um, in fact, my, I had my neighbor do this and she volunteered to do it. They took the panels off and they put the, uh, the filters on every one of the, uh, uh, the panels, put them all back together. And then they twisted all the wires uh, for the loop. And so it didn't act like a you know transmitting loop antenna. That solved that that took it down. Uh, gee, at least uh, four or five S units. But uh, the other the other possible way to do it uh, is to just um, filter the uh, uh, the cables that all come together in the co the combiner box for the solar array, and see if that'll stop it at that point. Um, but most of the time, it's it's the individual inverters on the the uh, the panels that are causing the problem and the way they're connected together. Is the combiner box that uh, a much smaller box that's uh, below the uh, inverter? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. now the thing that concerns me about doing anything on uh, that equipment uh, is the, uh, uh, I don't wanna do anything that's gonna avoid any warranties. Yeah. And I don't feel comfortable going into that stuff and working on high voltage anyhow. Well, it's not that high a voltage, but uh, I get your I get your point. But uh, uh, we just did that to a guy uh, in I6S at, at his house here, and uh, we just opened up the box and we put two snap-on filters on it, and the problem was solved. You know, it was a twenty-dollar solution fixed, and it knocked out all his noise. And it was the input and the output of the inverter actually that was causing the problem. Uh, it was the inverter was using the solar panels as uh, wiring as its antenna, and it was also using the AC uh, in, into the houses as the antenna. And so we put little stop signs, one on each side, and took about 10 minutes to do it. And most of that time was just unscrewing the panel <laughs> to get into it, and that solved the problem. So um, you, you may, you may want to ask your solar installer, hey, I've got some noise problems here. Is there a way for... Uh, you to take a look at that. And uh, and <clears throat> in some cases, they've called us and we tell them this is what you do to solve that problem. And, yeah, because uh, I've uh, asked them about it and uh, request that they do it. And everybody plays uh, dumb. Yep. Uh, the way they've got the thing set up, uh, 
is that uh, as a consumer, I can't talk to the manufacturer. In fact, I'm not even sure anymore who the manufacturer of the system is. And the company that installed it, uh, there, there, no one seems to uh, know anything about uh, uh, RFI. They never heard of it and uh, all the usual uh, BS that goes with it. Yeah, you're not, can, you're not alone. We can take some of that uh, conversation offline later. Uh, one of the issues uh, legally is that it's not your house, it's somebody else's house. You can't force them to do anything. And you, you're not responsible for some of their RFI problems uh, that they're receiving. That's another, that's another whole issue. Let's, uh, let's move on. I, I think David has got his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yes, David, thank you very much. And I've got uh, two sets of thanks for Bob. First, I think you've done a really excellent job of, of uh, providing a technical background on, on this problem. And frankly, you've encouraged me to try something. I've been just swamped by RFI here in central Escondido. I've almost given up, but I think that some of your tips on the coax uh, common mode uh, testing, that sounds great. So I'm gonna give that a try. I've got two different antennas I can do that with, uh, and that'd be great. And the second set of thanks I have for you is actually what you're doing to support amateur radio, both in the ARRL and locally and events like this. We need to do more of this. You just need to be recognized for doing the hard work you're doing, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, David, for your comments. Uh, RJ. Oh, hello. Okay. Oh, good. Not working. Uh, hey, Bob, uh, good to see you again. Uh, it seems like uh, it was eons ago at uh, Yuma when uh, when I saw your presentation yeah. there. <laughs> um, so when I came home, I did the uh, disconnect the shield off of the uh, coax and uh, it didn't make any difference, like you like said. So putting the inline filters probably wouldn't help me that I've probably just got common mode noise. I have apartment buildings all around me, so God knows what's in them. So here's, here's my question. What I've resorted to, and I'd like your comment on this, is a uh, uh, noise phase cancellation device or QRM eliminator, which really seems to help a lot using the second antenna to phase out the noise. Yep. It cuts down the RF slightly on the particular box that I have made by WIMO. Uh, however, when I had the time wave, which is no, it's not available due to whatever, that was extremely efficient. Uh, so it really cuts down the noise and it really helps getting the signal through. And I just want your comment. And how come maybe uh, Polymar hasn't uh, perfected that type of a device uh, to help out people with common noise that they can't get rid of in an apartment building that's right across the alley from them? Uh, so basically, that's, that's, that's my question. Uh, it'd be, I think you guys could probably build one that would probably be pretty slick and pretty efficient. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's my question. All right. You know, we had one of those back in the 80s. <laughs> it was predecessor to all the ones that are out there right now, but uh, th they do work just great. And, uh, and because they're, they're working on the RF part of the signal. They're working on the um, uh, not the common mode part. They're working on the actual signal, and you're phase, you're basically, you know, phasing those out. And uh, uh, I've used them before. Um, I've just uh, I've gotten to the point where I, I either I pick my antennas differently, or I put them in places where I know that those issues don't exist, or I can avoid them. Uh, that's how I solve the problem. I I don't like fiddling with a whole bunch of knobs all the time. I change frequency, I guess, and. Um, but uh, they they do work fine, and I will I will take the uh, <laughs> the request un, under advisement and see what we can do on that. But uh, there you know there are so many guys that that call uh, with so many issues, and it's it uh, that they're easy to fix with ferrites. That I tend to uh, uh, spend my time doing that and teaching people how to fix their own problems rather than than coming up with a, a slick gizmo that you know. Uh, fewer people can use or can afford. Everybody can afford a $10 ferrite, but they can't afford a $300 gizmo that, that may fix a specific problem. So I guess um, there's a lot of people, a lot of problems, and I can solve those that that, that I can and those that I can't. Uh, 
are just going to have to do it a different way or 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 uh, change change the uh, uh, change to a different solution. It just seems like uh, in traditionally ham operators like fiddling with knobs. I, yep. I don't know, yep. <laughs> but it, yeah, it, it's it's a, a efficient, especially on forty meters. Uh, it does wonderful on forty. Uh, where I don't have that, what I call ambient noise, whatever, you know, your or terrestrial noise. I refer to it as terrestrial noise. Uh, anyway, it, it, it helps. And in some of the bands, obviously, there isn't any of that noise. They're, they're very, very quiet. So, but I, I thank you for your opinion. And I, I mean, for me, it's been successful. I'm, I'm not here to, to, to sell them, but uh, they it, it's worked really really well for me so okay hopefully we'll see you in yuma in february yeah i, I plan to be there if we're going to be there there was supposed to be a lakeside ham fest today that got canceled the last night so oh it, my god yeah it was just you know, a lot of calls of people i had told to go to it today and because i was usually there speaking but uh I, I decided to do this one instead so yeah thank you so much uh and thank you rj for uh for your your question, I know you've been having a lot of trouble with 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 QRN uh, on your on your home station. So, one of the solutions that people do is they go operate from parks. You know, they get away from their local environment that's very noisy, and they go out to uh, some park someplace where and and do portable setups where there's not a lot of ambient noise. That's a solution for some people. Um, any other questions? I got one more comment about. Okay. Okay, parts of the let's air. see if there's another question first. Okay, go ahead, RJ. Yeah, it, it's a totally different HF experience when I go out to a park and away from everything and I have no noise at all. It's an amazing experience. So I suggest to people if they can try that, uh, it's, it's a world of difference, but yep. that's it. All right, I'll, I'll make one comment on that if I can. Uh, uh, we, um, you know, I give a talk on NFED antennas, and one of the an antennas we have is a, we call it the bullet antenna, because that's what the, the Boy Scouts named it. It looked like a big bullet. And the test was, is can you throw it over a branch of a tree and have it land and not break? And uh, now the Jamboree on the air uses thousands of those across the nation, but so does summits on the air, parks on the air, uh, a whole variety of other people use it. It's basically a uh, a 55 or 71 foot uh, uh, NFED uh, antenna that works mostly all the bands and uh, usually without an antenna tuner and uh, they work they work extremely well they're they're not NFED half waves they are NFED non resonance because the NFED half waves have high voltage on them and I don't particularly like that and so uh, these are very friendly and uh, you can throw them against the wall practically the in, the matching units on them they're called the bullet antenna systems if you want to look at them all the all that you can make them yourself by the way but also all the parts are there and uh, all the uh, different types of configurations we've sold thousands of these things they are just really popular and um, uh, if you haven't tried uh uh, portable operations with them, even with 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 watts. Okay, they work just great with a little solar panel or something like that. You can get on the air and, and have a lot of fun and and not deal with all the noise for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's the act, that's the antenna that I use, unfortunately, from a different manufacturer, but it's yeah. a 60 foot NFED and it is it's wonderful. And I'm sure yours is the same way. It's so universal and 7300 tunes to all of the bands yep. without an external tuner. Yeah, it's a great design. Yep. I think Lenny had his hand up. Yeah, one uh, one quick question, if I might. Um, and I put it in in chat. Um, I use a, an external remote antenna switch at the uh, base of the tower. Mm -hmm. it handles the, uh, the the stepper and it handles two wire antennas. Now, would I be putting filtering at the point of the main uh, lead out to the uh, switch, or on each of the antennas? Well, the best way to do it would be on each of the antennas. Okay, so they 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 come down with the tower, and you put one on each uh, where they're suspended. Well, it, there's two, two, two different purposes. Uh, in, in your case, I would say uh, you would put it at the input to the antenna switch. 
the input, the antenna side of the antenna switch. So each one of the three antennas would have it right there where you're switching it. And then uh, your common line, your common line doesn't need one and just run that. That way the antennas are essentially isolated from each other. The coaxes are isolated. And that's usually the problem is that uh, it's the coax braids that nobody thinks about, but they're never switched. And but they're but they're still sitting there as part of the antenna because they're all they're all common to the insides. Now that that was an amazing piece for me. That was probably one of the key pieces of information that I gathered from this whole talk was the point of multiple antennas going through a switch, all having their common mode uh, bonded together. Yep. It, understanding that really makes a lot of sense now on how to isolate them from each other. And, and Lenny nailed it. Nailed it, that's the exact answer. So you need to put that the, the line isolators on each of the antenna feeds coming into the switch. That's right. That's Let brilliant. Me follow up. Um, the um, the uh, lead-in um, coax is about 120 feet. Um, what would you recommend with regards to that, if anything, after you've um, uh, put the filtering at uh, at uh, each antenna? I, I would, since you're writing an Alpha 87A, I would assume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do you know that? Oh, you saw it in my picture. I see it in your picture. Uh, yeah, I have a five. I have a Henry 5K behind here. You you can't see either, but uh, I, I there's a um, uh, a common mode noise filter. We call them common mode noise filters. A 5K version, and that would go right into the uh, uh, right right <clears throat> the entrance to your shack, so to speak. Uh, into your radio and, and that would act as the noise filter for uh, that long coax run that you got in here. So that would be the receive end of it. And the other end of it would be working on transmit, isolating the shields from each other. But I would, on the common line coming back, back, you know, put the, it's a little box, four inches by four inches by two inches and just put that in there in series, got two connectors on it. And then just run a small jumper to your, to your amp or to your antenna tuner or whatever you're using inside. It comes in first. So that would go well. It comes into the antenna tuner. Yeah, I just put it. I just put it on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> those are all fifty ohm lines coming in, right? So they're not. Yeah. So I would just put it in the fifty ohm line coming into your uh, your your antenna tuner there. Okay. Very good. Thank yep. you. Yep. Uh, the way to the way to ask a question is just uh, click your hand up. There's a little button in the notifications at the bottom of your screen. If, if, it is, if they've got a newer one, it's in reactions. So I have a question. Uh, I have uh, an amplifier like that, and it only has one feed line out, but that feed line goes to uh, a junction box on the outside of the house with lightning arresters. And I can switch antennas manually, or I can, uh, so do I need, uh, at the outside of each each lightning arrestor, do I need that common mode line isolator? No, not for, uh, not for the line, not for the line uh, isolate, not, I'm not, I'm, wrong word, not for the, uh, um, <clears throat> not for the right. lightning, no, just, just one is all you need. Okay. The common line coming in is what you would need it on, yeah. And the, the part number is it's called common mode noise filter CMNF-5000 is the is the part number on that. And you look it up and it's uh it's a high it's a very high impedance 5 kW box that you just plug in. Perfect. That uh, Henry 5K is a nice amp. It's a very nice amp. Yeah, it's a very very good one. Yep. Any other questions? If you're on an iPad and you want to raise your hand, it's the three dots in the upper right. And yep. then there's a drop down menu. Well, this has been a terrific presentation. And I, I've, I've learned a couple of things that were key, absolutely essential information. And what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Palomar Engineering uh, website. There's kits there that you can get for specific things. Like uh, I, I run digital modes, so I need to get something for my uh, lines going from the radio to my computer, uh, and so on, and then also some RFI kits from the from on the back of the radios. 
Uh, so there's all kinds of things we can do. I don't have a huge RFI issue uh, because I use resident antennas for the most part, uh, but I certainly want to make sure I don't get any uh, common mode noise, so I'm going to really take care of that business. Um, so I wanted to thank thank you, Bob, very much. Uh, Cecil's still here. So any, any final comments, Cecil, before we uh, go to the parking lot? Well, I have to agree that the one big thing I learned was the uh, the uh, tennis switch with a common ground. I just never, ever, ever thought of that one. And boy, was that a, a real fight for, I think, for all of us. Yeah, thank you, Bob. It, it really was a great presentation. I, I really think all of us picked up a lot from your presentation. I, we all appreciate it because... We Thank all you. Know how, I, we all know how valuable our time is. Uh, that's all I got, Dave. Uh, okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure that everyone here has attempted to log on to the website. I know mean, you've probably heard this before, but it's it's really essential that uh, for the members to be able to log on to the website. So just to review that, when you go there, uh, your old login and old password won't work on the new website. So just go there and hit lost password at the at the sign in and then it'll take you to the screen where you just put your call sign in and then hit go and it'll it'll send you a link from the from the email address that you had on on the old website and then you can reset your password and log in with your call sign and uh, the password that uh, that you'll rec that you'll create all right uh, I encourage all of you to go to the website and log in there's a lot of information there for the members that are not visible without logging in. So uh, all of you guys take care. I'm going to, I'm going to let you, uh, I'm going to go dark here and you guys can just hang out and, and thank you, Bob. You guys can all hang out and chat if you wish. I won't close the zoom session. So you can uh, go to the parking lot and talk among yourselves like you normally do. And I wanted to thank all of you for, for showing up today and uh, we'll have another presentation next month. Uh, I've got to beat the bushes and get somebody. <laughs> okay, 7-3-all. Thanks again, Bob. Thank you.